day, what a place, what a people, what a God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have to make one correction, oh yeah, he had to love you like that. He had to. God is love. He has no choice. <laughs> so glad, so thankful. Hallelujah. Let me begin by announcing next week, Father's Day, June, June. <laughs> boy, oh boy, that seemed a little uh, timid there. But it's your time, Dad, it's your time to get even. <clears throat> June 16th, a week from today already. Also, uh, I want to say congratulations to Frank and Kelly Palumbo on the birth of their new baby girl. <laughs> Look at this. Look. And this one. There we go. This is Mila Raven Palumbo. Seven pounds, two ounces when she was born. And just the happiest, most beautiful creature as they all are. Amen. So thank you for that. Also, uh, it's a couple months out already, I know, but save the date, August 4th, 2024. Jam for the Lamb. It's the first Sunday of every year. And... Uh, we look forward to that, and it'll be here before you know it, although it's, uh, I think, seven weeks out right now. So God bless you, and be saving the date, as they say. And I have to drink to that. Ah, good. Now I want to... Uh, take your prayer request, or I should say, want to pray over your request. I already have taken them. In the room, I have Shelley and Promise, Robert, Swanson family, Bodine, Chris, Stephanie, Anne Marie, Dan F., Sarah, Chaz, Mitchell, Matthew, Michelle, Grizel, or Grizzle, or Grizette. One of the, uh, am I close? Somebody? Okay, Grizzle, good. And Reed. Uh, also, the last time I looked this morning, I have a, a couple on my Facebook page. Um, just to let you know, uh, Jack Horner, who was, you've heard me speak of him a couple of times. He was my uh, high school band director, of whom I was so fond of. He did pass away uh, a couple of days ago. So remember that family, they're in uh, North Carolina, actually. So I appreciate that, and, and uh, I would like to do a whole memorial for him myself, but I won't do that today. There's probably 5,000 kids, including myself, who would love to do the same thing. He's that kind of a guy. And also for Marcia, she doing good uh, still? Vic? Good. Okay. And Michelle, uh, Susan Hall's daughter, had surgery on Friday, and she's doing well. A little bit uh, uh, painful, but recovering nicely, and it went well. So I'm glad to hear that. Also, Gwen, you, you'll see Jerry sitting over there looking like a little lost puppy dog. Uh, Gwen is still not feeling... Um, wise to come out today she's been ailing with a flu-like thing so for Gwen uh, Jerry be sure and let her know also praise report Jackie you want to do it or you want me to do it
Thank you for that. Thank you, Jackie. I know she is like number one with these cards. I, I don't have my phone case, but the holster, I guess you call it. I carry my phone case in. I carry at least one or two of those envelopes and business cards right in there where I know I'll have them. And it's very, very uh, easy and powerful when you uh, believe. And so thank you for that. I hope you all heard what she said, but there's a person uh, that she worked with, Judy, her husband had a tumor on uh, his liver. <laughs> that was quick. Whoops. That reminds us all, doesn't it? Double check, don't hurt. Okay. So anyway, he had a cancerous tumor, and uh, after prayer and and uh, believing, and Jackie's uh, ministering to him, uh, he was scheduled for a surgery, and they canceled it because uh, it had disappeared, and there was nothing to operate on. So we're glad of that, and for. Denny's neighbor, Cindy, uh, her husband, she has cancer and they're asking prayer also for her husband uh, to get through this, you know, strength. And for Wes, for health issues, and for George and his daughter, also uh, battling cancer there. And I sure am glad that the battle is the Lord's. And for Gordy Peterson from Kathleen. Okay. So, uh, Lori, you have something? I can't hear you. Honey. What's the first name? Lord. Lloyd. Lloyd. Okay. So he's your nephew. Okay. We expect good report from that. Okay, Rick, go ahead. What's her first name? Her name is Emily. Emily. Yeah. Emily, listen up. The Lord's uh, delivering you today. Yeah. Yeah. He has a voice. He speaks. Yeah. Don't pretend you don't hear. You heard. <laughs> okay, Lori, go ahead, honey. Mm -hmm. Okay, for David and Todd. It is.
That's what you do. You, okay, I got it. Yeah, for Mike. And all night too. <laughs> I know. I'm glad we have a heavenly advocate who never sleeps. Jehovah never sleeps. I'm writing that down. I don't want him to forget. Okay, so we good? Okay, Keith, wild guitar today. Just outrageous, man. Wow. Wow. Pray for plenty more of that. Whew, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's all agree together, and those of you who are watching on the internet, if you'd also agree with us, we'd be grateful. Let, let us pray now. Oh, let us pray now. Our Father in heaven, it is such a wonderful, wonderful experience always when we gather this way. The place of meeting, you're always the first to arrive. And we're so happy. We're so honored and privileged to be able to come before you with anything and everything. Without fear, without worry. With total freedom to ask and believe that we receive help in our time of need. We praise you. We thank you for all good things. We thank you for the way you're able to minister above and beyond what any of us could ever think or imagine or even ask. We ask that you would minister in a way that is a definite witness and a powerful one to the magnificent moving power of Jesus Christ, which is alive here and everywhere. And we send this spirit, this word, this power, and the wind, God's wind, God's breath himself, in order that we may receive what we have asked. We ask for healing, comfort, strength, renewal, all that we need. The details are all included. You know. We ask you for this, and we know that we have what we ask when we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Prayer is so powerful. It is the most powerful thing there is. The spoken word. It's, it's good to share that with God. No other creature does. Hallelujah. Righteousness through faith. We're going to begin with a Bible reading. Is that okay here on the <laughs> on Sunday morning? <laughs> right in church. Romans chapter 3. I so love the Bible. For it is the means, it is the menu. Jesus is the meal. A lot of people eating a lot of junk food, a lot of garbage from, from the stuff that whirls around in their head. 
that they think they know, that they heard somewhere, but it wasn't really on the menu. Quit eating out of garbage cans. Don't be dumpster diving. When God has given you the feast of angels. Hallelujah. Verse 21. Righteousness through faith in Christ. Paul is speaking, of course, to the Romans who are not Jews. They're not Christians. They're Romans. That's why the book is called Romans. <laughs> See? <laughs> so, but this is about the law. The law of Moses and, and so forth. To bring you up to speed, but then in verse 20 says, But now, apart from the law, righteousness of God, the righteousness of God has been revealed. Apart from the law, as attested by the law and the prophets, they said it would be. And sure enough, here it is. And this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Why wouldn't we just accept that and get off the treadmill and the ritual and the routine and the blood, sweat, and tears and barely hanging on? Why wouldn't we just accept God at His Word? There is no distinction, no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Only preachers could muddle this to where nobody could figure it out. Only theologians could make this not true. It is the simplest word that any child could understand. Apart from law, apart from any structure, the righteousness of God comes in one and only one way. Through faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing and no one else shares in this. Christ, Christ only. And all the little children said, Amen, Hallelujah, me too. God presented him, that is Christ, as the atoning sacrifice through faith in His blood in order to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in His forbearance, He has passed over the sins committed beforehand. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time, that is, Christ did, so as to be just and to justify the one who has faith in Jesus. You always end up back where you started. Faith in Jesus. He is the Alpha, the beginning. He is Omega, the end. Verse 27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of works? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You see, the Romans who were not under law were always under pressure by the Jews to come under law in order to be saved. 
This is the saddest thing to observe. It's the saddest thing for Paul. It's the saddest thing for me to see more seasoned, well-meaning, but misguided Christians try to bring other younger ones under their version of righteousness and begin to impose upon them their rules, their convictions, their beliefs, and assign them these taxes, if you will, to that which God has given tax-free. No strings. To offend one of these little ones, beyond the obvious of the little children, and there's an unspeakable condemnation for those who abuse children, and I can't even go there. I would tear this room apart. But we also are little children. And we ought not be overlorded by the systems of religious bureaucracy. Structures, inanimate, cold and dead, institutionalized, lifeless things. It might as well be a carved statue as to impose anything other than freedom and grace and the love and mercy of God on anyone, no matter who they are, no matter where they've been, no matter what they've done or what they're doing now. Righteousness comes in one way, not by you quitting anything, but by you receiving someone into your life. First things first. Where is boasting? For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? See, this is always, this was the dilemma. God was always the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so forth. So no one else ever felt like they would ever have any chance. They were just unlucky and condemned. Dogs, outsiders, with no hope, without God. That's what the word means. But is God not a, the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God, did you hear me? Who will justify the Jews by faith and the Gentiles through that same faith. There's no higher God you can appeal to. There are no large, vast numbers of gods you can run to for shelter. Verse 31, I'll just say that. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Was the law irrelevant? Did it have no effect? Did it have no meaning? Oh, no. Certainly not. Instead, we uphold the law. The law was the pathway to the person of Jesus Christ. Without law, there would be no Christianity. Without Moses, there would be no Christ. But now that one greater has come, Moses is honored and revered in his place. And he would be first to say so. The law was the school teacher, t 
teacher, uh, I almost said school marm. That's too old for you guys. You wouldn't understand that. Tutor. How's that? Bringing us to Christ. It taught us, number one, there is the law of God that is perfect, beautiful, but it's superimposed upon people who are imperfect and ugly at times. This is an impossible situation. No one can be saved. Not even if you try harder. Start over again. Make a New Year's resolution. Turn over a new leaf even. Repent and weep tears until the floor is wet. Not even that. Someone else who has power and the desire to bring to us the answer, the only answer that will suffice. We are hopelessly separated, lost and undone from holy God with no way home. But for this man Christ and the way you possess him is by casting your faith on him. In that moment, he will be yours. You will be his. No longer two, but one. Hallelujah. There is a transfer of trust. It's a little bit of a banking term. Acts 16.31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You will. When the Bible uses the term believe, it doesn't simply mean to agree with certain ideas or doctrines. Biblical belief involves a transfer of trust from ourselves to Christ. All our assets at the central bank of self have been transferred to the royal bank of Christ. We moved everything we had into this new religion, this new way, this new faith. We took a chance. We went all in. If we lose that hand, if we made a bad bet, the game is over. But if we're right, if we chose a winner, eternity is secure. I don't want to shock you, but you came from eternity. And you're here in this little brief window for a few decades and you shall return there from where you came. You're in this little body now. But you didn't begin there. You had no beginning. You, like God, are an eternal being. Eternal means not merely unending with no end. It also means there was no beginning. God had no beginning. When you go to the book of Genesis, it doesn't say, in the beginning, God was created. No. This is what the world does. This is simple. And there's nothing else, really, but this in the world. We are of those who believe that our God 
created us. The unbelievers believe exactly the opposite. They created their God. And no matter what they call their God, no matter what religion it may be, what they really are calling God is themselves. The minute you name your God, you are God. You are naming gods. You are not only a king, you are a king maker. You are a fool who has said in your heart, there is no God. You are indescribably mentally bankrupt. But you can be saved in a moment's time. Today. In one way. The only way that millions could be saved in a moment is by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. If they had to go somewhere, do anything, the lines would be too long. If you add one dollar to salvation and put the sign up out, the line would go around the block if people thought they could buy it. But as the Bible says to Simon the sorcerer, the Spirit of God cannot be bought with money. Your money will perish with you. When he saw the gift of God, the manifestation, the people were speaking in unknown tongues and all kinds of things, miracles everywhere. He said, wow, that's better than my stuff. How much is this? How much is this? You put a price on it, they'll line up. Whatever you can purchase, you own. But the one who purchases you, owns you. Better to be owned by one more capable <laughs> than us. Okay. The wise of this world are too proud not to boast in their salvation. In fact, they have a much better salvation than the one in the Bible that the common Christian, Christians embrace. They shall achieve a far superior place in eternity than the unlearned and naive simpletons who only trust in a far-off Savior whom they've never seen. They got that beat all to pieces. These naive, uneducated, unlearned, simple Christian people, they don't know anything. They're not, they're not as smart as we are. The salvation that they have, it's nothing. We have that beat. Look how superior we are. Look how brilliant we are. Look how much knowledge we have. How much means and wealth and power. Look at my office and look at my titles look at this and all they have is some God afar off wow where is boasting there is boasting some say I'm not that bad of a person why should I be worried that thinking is unbiblical at its core the apostle Paul wanted to be found in Christ not having a righteousness of his own but the righteousness from God by faith. If anyone knew the difference, the contrast, the total opposite, polar opposite of the law was righteousness by faith. Philippians 3.9 When Martin Luther came to understand faith, as trusting in Christ alone for righteousness, he exclaimed, Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. The moment he offloaded his desperate overload 
of achievements and works to somehow obtain salvation. And to be in a place where finally he would be right with God. He would have God's favor. God would be pleased with him. He finally worked enough, long enough, and would arrive. But then later on, he said, I don't count myself as having arrived. Paul did. But I am one who constantly strives for the mark, for the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. You're reaching up for God as Rust mentioned there Wednesday night. You're intimate with God. And you, you just can't, you can't get enough. You can't quite get where you want to go. But you can't give up and say, oh, well, nobody can do it. You, gotta, you, you can't stop. You cannot stop. That's what I meant earlier when I said, God cannot help but love us. He doesn't have a choice. He is love. It's not what He does. It's who He is. It's not an adjective. It's a noun. Hallelujah. The gates of paradise are only open to those who have transferred their whole estate to Jesus Christ. You keep back part of the price, you lose it all. Don't play around with religion. All that you have, all that you are, everything that's inside of you is vulnerable and volatile and sure to be lost. Except you put it in the bank where it will be saved. The bank of the trust in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may enter the city by the gates. Revelation seven fourteen. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. If you have deposited all you have with Christ, the dividends of everlasting life and joy await you there. Matthew six thirty three. Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. Not last. First. And all these things will be added unto you. You believe it? Yes. If you do, you've already done it. If you don't, quit lying. <laughs> verse, well, verse 34. If you've done this. If, you, if God is first in your life. Don't worry about tomorrow. If he is not first, you have something to worry about. And worry won't save you. It will only hasten the, your demise. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. Don't borrow trouble from the future and add it to, the, to today. You have a day's worth of grace at a time no more. It's enough. When the children of Israel in the desert depended on God to feed them every day, if they tried to hoard up the food, it ruined, it rotted, and they couldn't eat it. But they got the day's worth right on time, just like God said. God is enough, just enough, every day. Make Christ your source, and He will watch over your resources. I've said this before. Most of you know I worked at the General Motors in the 80s. There about 15 years, really. And General Motors, I always felt, was my source. And so when I left there, I thought, I don't know how people live. There's no security. General Motors is secure. What, what are, how are people living? Without this security. Next thing I know, General Motors went bankrupt. <laughs> Y'all forgot that. Because it's all phony, you know that. 
the whole world's phony. Don't kid yourself. But still, it was an object lesson to me that the Lord just sort of tapped me on the shoulder. See there, dummy? See that? I'm going to write a book about you. You dummy. You don't want to be one in one of those books. But I learned that then I, then when I transferred my estate into the bank of trust, the real bank of trust, I never worried again to this day, to my final day. Worry is a terrible sin. Jesus said, Stop. Do not worry. It wasn't a suggestion. It was a commandment. Don't do it. Stop it now. now. Next time you hear somebody say, well, you can't help but worry, I say, you need to get in here. If you're telling me that, then this whole book is bogus. So you think I'm going to take your word... That's something you just have heard all your life over God's word who gave us life. Sorry, I can't go there. I'm going with God every time. All the way. I don't care how long, how far, how hard. I just know who to go with. When you transfer your estate into his account, now, you have emptied yourself of your own righteousness and trusting fully in Him to watch over it. If you trust Him, you won't worry. The reason you're worried at night about the banks, the economy, everything that's going on in the world, the reason you can't rest, worried about your bank. We all live in the same world. I've been up and down in all this stuff, but my source is God. If your source is God, He has resources all over the earth, all over the world. He will bring you resources if you make Him your source. If your paycheck or whatever it is that you're doing is your source, you have reason to worry. You can be history in a day. But in Christ, it's forever. Hallelujah. Don't, I don't want to get stuck there. Bank fully on Jesus Christ and sleep well. You worried about the economy? Have you ever seen a bird wringing its hands? You ever see a worried bird? Jesus said, the, the birds aren't worried. They have nests, you know, the animals, they're not worried. They have holes in the ground, they're not worried. So what he's telling you is, just live like animals. Amen. See, we're already halfway there. Animals don't worry. Animals don't, they have no idea that they're going to die someday. They don't know that, so they don't worry. The Christian knows for sure he can never die, and yet he worries. We ought to at least be smarter than the animals. Hallelujah, you caused me to get stuck here. A father greater than all. John 10, 28. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Not out of my hand, not out of His hand. I and the Father are one. You believe it? And get to the bank. The bank of the righteousness of God. 
The Christian should never think or speak in unbelief. You shouldn't say doubtful things. You shouldn't talk silly like the world. We have the word of God. That is our native tongue. That's our language. How can we doubt the power or the reach of God's grace? How can we doubt that God's arm is too short to save? How can we doubt after all we've seen, after the floodwaters have overcome us so many times over these years, we're going to stumble over a puddle now? Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child or lack compassion for the son of her womb? Even if she could forget, I will not forget you. Chapter 54, verse 10. The mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. If only one of his sheep shall, should slip through his fingers, the integrity of God, his grace and honor are all brought into question. Can God not keep his word? Is he not faithful? Banish fear and doubt and affront to the one who gave himself for us and lives forever making intercession for us. Shake off the dust of unbelief and put on your garment of praise. Let eternal life spring forth from within you in much rejoicing. Confess his lordship over your life and his deliverance from the evil that is against you. Sing it loud. Sing it loud. The evil that comes against you, God meant it for good and turns it to good. Joseph told his brothers that who betrayed him and sold him into slavery and lied. They were just treacherous as they could be. Joseph didn't say, aha, now I got you. He said, no, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God made him prime minister and fed two countries with the, from his granaries because God is in the business of feeding people, not starving them. God is one who builds things, not tears things down. Remember that. The goal of the Christian. Romans chapter 8. Here it is. Pretty small Bible, isn't it? Anybody want to read for me? I can zoom it. For the glory of God. You know, I have eye treatments all the time. I have cataracts and all that stuff. And I go to the ophthalmologist every three months. And I've had surgeries and this and that. My vision is better now than when I was 13 years old. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. They don't make print I can't read. With or without my glasses. Except this one here. <laughs> no, just kidding. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Now listen to this. For did you not receive the Spirit... Uh, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, 
Father. So what spirit do you have? A fearful spirit? You got that from your grandmother probably. Your mother, your father, your aunt, somebody. That fearful spirit that you have that you deny that's what it is. You just being concerned. It's fear. It goes beyond caution. It's a spirit. It's not your friend. It ought not be guiding you and directing your path and giving you counsel. Weigh the facts. Trust in the Lord. Do not fear. Live or die. You belong to the Lord. No spirit of fear has one ounce of strength over you. One iota of power in your life. How dare you allow such a thing in competition with the spirit of adoption that God has given you. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's how you know you're saved. That's how you know you're saved. Not because you believe certain paragraphs and sentences in the Bible. Here's the knower. A lot of people think they are but they don't know they are. Knowing is in the spirit. The spirit is the knower. The brain thinks. The normal brain thinks and calculates. And you got to have it or you're a vegetable. But no brain comprehends even the concept of supernatural, much less God. But the spirit knows what the brain has no way to know, don't be mean to your brain. <laughs> it wasn't created for that. The Spirit is not for thinking, you hear me? And double thinking, and overthinking, until finally you find a reason why not. That's not what the Spirit is for. The Spirit is to bear witness with God's Spirit. It's time to move. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs or co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation, earnest expectation doesn't mean genuine. Earnest means a deposit, a earnest deposit. As in real estate. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. That would be us. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. That's decay, death, dying, rotting, all of creation. It will be delivered into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know in our spirit that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit. That's our deposit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly awaiting for the adoption of the redemption of our body. Your redemption is finally completed once the body itself is redeemed or changed. The Spirit was saved in the day that you believed and were born again. Your soul is being saved right now, constantly, as long as you follow this way. But eventually, even your body will be saved. And then... The whole of salvation is fulfilled, body, spirit, and soul. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. You're not still hoping to get saved or hoping you're saved. You should already have that settled by now. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with persecution. So, the goal of the Christian is not to make it to heaven. 
You should have already settled that. You should already know that you're going to heaven. Are you happy about that? You look kind of down about it. You love this place. I bet you don't love this place more than I do. But it has not even entered into your heart what's waiting for you. It's, I, are you still worried about death? Are you still worried about dying? Are you worried about that? It's behind you. You still worried about last week, are you? You worried about that pitiful baseball game that's already over? You worried about that today? Is that still on your mind? That's over. You should have already got rid of that. We may... We, our goal now is to live the rest of our life leading others to heaven. Not still trying to work your way to heaven. Hoping you'll get there. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. No wonder you're so tired. We waste much of our Christian life struggling with things we should have overcome years ago. We should be helping others over those things by now. In other words, our interests should no longer be divided, but fully on what Christ is interested in. Our focus is not on us. It's on other people. As soon as we get over us, we'll have a burden for others. And not until in conclusion this. We call him Father. Luke 11, 2. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Spirit of adoption we have. Not a spirit of fear. The moment a child is adopted into the family, their whole life changes. They get a new name, an entirely new way of life. Yet they may not feel a true sense of belonging to the family. It's one thing to come and live in a new home, but quite another to fully experience being a member of the family. To call one's new parents, mommy and daddy. The same is true of our spiritual adoption. When we profess our faith in Jesus Christ, our adoption changes our eternal status. But God wants us to know what it means to be his son or his daughter. He wants us to think of him as our father. Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Being born again is far more than a legal transaction, though it is certainly that. Salvation is not just the forgiveness of sins. It is the beginning of a powerful transformation which will never end. What Jesus accomplished on the cross, the Spirit continues in our hearts. The cross turned the history of mankind in another direction. The Spirit testifies you are truly His. You've been bought at the greatest price. You are loved and cherished. Christian, whatever else is true of you, here's the greatest reality. You are a child of God. Nothing and no one can change that. Whatever else you are feeling, let this truth comfort you, ground you, reassure you, and motivate you. You are a child of God. Only cry out, have a father. So, Wednesday night. I dare you. you, you you're, all, you're all cowards, I dare you. Bye-bye for now.